on the tables outside of council chambers. You must fill out a speaker card in order to address the city council. Please hand in your completed card to the city clerk before the start of the meeting. If the meeting has already begun, please hand it to any city staff. You may also check the I do not wish to speak option on the card. This allows you to still voice your opinion on an item on the record without having to speak. Public comment on a non-agenda item will take place during the citizen comment portion of the evening. These are items that don't appear on tonight's formal agenda. The city clerk will call your name when it's time for you to speak. At that time, please approach the podium and state your name for the record. We ask that you speak clearly into the microphone. You'll have a maximum of three minutes and there is a timer visible from the podium. When the light changes from green to yellow, your time is coming to an end. When the light turns red, your time is up. Note that you may also choose not to speak if other speakers before you have said what you wanted to say. Shouting, cheering, and loud noises will not be tolerated, and violators may be removed for disrupting the meeting. Goodyear City Council meetings stream live on Facebook and YouTube and online at GoodyearAZ.gov. Thank you for your participation in tonight's meeting. Regular meeting for September 23rd, 2019. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance and stay standing for the on vacation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all thy blessings and new opportunities you've bestowed upon our city of Goodyear, our neighborhoods, neighboring cities, and we thank you for our council leadership as responsible, trustworthy stewards. And we ask that you reveal to us new wisdom and ideas which will unite us as one, causing us all to prosper as a community, which demonstrates respect and values for all our lives for your word to fill our hearts and our minds with intentional sound financial decisions for our city as our home and industries grow. Lord, we ask for special prayers for our committed staff, our shared vision, our city manager, as they continue to serve our city in lockstep with council. And Lord, we ask for your blanket of protection for our police and fire, for men and women uh, in the armed services serving throughout the world. In your name, amen. Everyone is present this evening. So we have three communication items. The first one is a proclamation re recognizing October as Domestic Violence Awareness. Mariah Mahoon from the New Life Center is here to accept the proclamation. If you'll come forward, Mahaya. Violated over and over again. Thank you. We greatly appreciate it. You, Just a moment. I'm not very coordinated. I'll hold it for you. <laughs> I got it. All right. So here we go. My Domestic Violence Awareness Month, October 2019th. Whereas October is recognized nationally as Domestic Violence Awareness Month, the city of Goodyear wants to demonstrate its support in ending domestic violence and support the numerous victims who are among us. And whereas Domestic Violent Awareness Month provides an opportunity to educate people on the seriousness of domestic violence. Whereas domestic violence is defined as the pattern of forcible control, where one par partner uses the power to control the other partner. 
Domestic violence can take any form, many forms, including physical, sexual, emotional, financial abuse. Whereas everyone has the right to live free from domestic violence, statistics reveal that one in four women and one in seven men will experience domestic violence in their lifetime. Whereas every 60 seconds, approximately 24 Americans are victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. Whereas preventing instances of domestic violence is concern and preventing domestic violence is a community. I'm going to say that again. It's a community responsibility. Finding solutions depends on involvement among the people. Again, among the people. Involvement throughout the community, including city officials, citizens, schools, and churches, whereas all citizens should become more aware of how they can prevent domestic violence by building communities where individuals flourish. They flourish in a safe and nurturing environment, and that you certainly work very hard at. Thank you. Whereas all citizens should become more aware. Did I say this? They can prevent domestic violence by building communities where individuals flourish in safe and nurturing environments. So, this is my pleasure. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, George Lord, the mayor of the city of Goodyear, Arizona, do proclaim October 29th as Domestic Violence Awareness Month and urge citizens of Goodyear to work together to eliminate domestic violence in our community. Given on my hand in these free United States and the city of Goodyear on the first day of April 2019, to which have caused the seal of the city of Goodyear to be affixed and have made this proclamation public. Could we give a round of applause for all the work they do? I'm going to leave that practice in. Now, you wonder why we're all in purple. Well, that's the color of the month in October for this. And so we're going to take a moment and bring the council down, and we're going to take a picture of all the purple we have here today. You're welcome. Thanks again. So you want to grab it? All right, the next item is an overview of the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association, 50-year role in regional water collaboration. Executive Director Warren Tenney to present. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Here you have the floor to bring yes, introductions. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. We're honored uh, to be uh, visited tonight by uh, Warren Tenney, who is the Executive Director of the Arizona Municipal Water Association. Could you He's put that share. microphone just a little bit closer? All of the great things that, um, that AMWA has been doing over the last 50 years. Um, being a member of AMWA, it's really crucial for the city. It's a good, great way for us to stay informed. Uh, engage and ultimately have uh, influence in those things that uh, will impact us in the short and long term. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Warren Tenney. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Appreciate this, Mayor and Council members, for this opportunity to visit with you tonight to talk about working together on water and the never-ending effort to keep our glasses full. I, if you will indulge me just for a moment to share a little personal story that puts some of this in perspective. My uh, son, Nathaniel, is 21, and he has been for the last 15 months in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And in, um, I've, as a dad, of course, I've had lots of worries, but I'm g glad to report that he's happy and having quite the adventure. In uh, 
uh, recently, Nathaniel has shared that in Sierra Leone, they do not have running water as we know it. They get their water either from a well, a truck, or a dam. And at the place where he is currently living, they have water tanks that are filled periodically from a pipe that comes from the dam. And so when I talk about dam, I do not mean Roosevelt or Hoover Dam, but the dam that you see there on the right. And so um, twice already they have run out of water. And um, the situation started to repeat itself again. And the tanks were running dry because there wasn't water coming from the dams. And so Nathaniel gave a call trying to get some help and was told that the pipe had been cut. And so then they were to put out buckets to collect rainwater in hopes of getting some water that way. And then they were told by a maintenance worker, the next day you should have water. So the morning came and they waited and they waited. And then finally there was water. And this 21 year old kid's response was, it's a miracle. Mm -hmm. Well, these small things that we often take granted for really are a miracle. And it is quite a miracle how we are able to have water every day of the year. And that's a lot in large part because of the hard work of your staff, your water utility staff, and making certain that things are always working well and being able to bring water here. We have recognized as a state that we live in the desert. It's arid. And therefore, we better wring out every drop of water that we can. And we do that because we know that water fuels our way of life and our economy. Fifty years ago, in 1969, the city leaders from from, um, the city leaders from uh, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Mesa, Tempe and Glendale decided to establish the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association or AMWA. And they did this because they knew that water does not flow according to political jurisdiction, and it would be better to work together on water policy issues. So today, AMWA consists of 10 cities that span this valley. Together, the AMWA cities provide water to three and a half million people. That is more than half of the state's population. We also provide water to the businesses and industries that are key to the state's economy. We are all linked together. And if in, in recognizing that if one city in the valley is having a water challenge, we're all considered to be in the same situation. So AMWA provides that forum to work together. During our 50 years, AMWA has played an important role in finding solutions for many of our state's water challenges. A few of our accomplishments include being heavily involved in the passage of the 1980 Groundwater Management Act, as seen in the top left photo. We have also worked with um, uh, APS and uh, many of our members to have an agreement to be able to deliver reclaimed water to help cool the Palo Verde nuclear power plant. We were also involved in um, uh, developing the concept for underground water storage legislation that allows us to be able to store water in the aquifer and then use it when needed. We have also worked hard to elevate the importance of reclaimed water as a water supply. And most recently, we have um, worked with our members to help implement in Arizona the passage of the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan. DCP is a key example of how coordinating and working together on these issues gives our municipalities strength in numbers. This included having Javier uh, Sedovich serve on the DCP steering committee along with other municipal representatives. One of AMWA's ongoing and most significant contribution has been to in contributing and developing a water conservation ethic here in the Phoenix metro area and in Arizona. 
For nearly 40 years, Arizona has mandated conservation requirements for the municipalities. In response, AMWA pulled together uh, water conservation pro um, professionals to develop a regional water conservation program. From that effort, we now have each of our cities have unique programs specific for their communities to help residents reduce their water use. Today, AMWA cities are recognized across the country as leaders in water conservation. It is because of this water conservation ethic that we have not had to impose water restrictions during this time of prolonged drought. We are continually working to increase awareness um, about all of these programs with the public at, so that they know what they can do as they hear more and more about drought, shortage, and uh, climate change. Today, as we face shortages on the Colorado River and deal with other water supply issues, cooperation among municipalities is all that more critical. At all levels of our cities, we are facilitating discussions to find solutions. The AMWA Board of Directors is comprised of the mayor or a council member from each of our member cities. We are fortunate to have Council Member Loretano serving on the AMWA Board. We also are engaged with our city's water utility directors and water resources staff, including your st with your staff. In fact, Javier serves as the vice chair for our management board, and Gretchen Irwin and, Re and Ray Diaz actively engage in our water resources and conservation advisory groups. As we collaborate and worked on issues, AMWA then advocates for our members as we work with the Arizona Department of Water Resources, CAP, and um, SRP. Our most important advocacy effort is to speak with one active voice at the legislature. A key guiding principle for us as we work at the legislature at the legislature is does the legislation strengthen the foundation that we have from the Groundwater Management Act and the 100-year assured water supply rules? Is it smart water policy that will keep the glass full? AMWA will continue to shine a bright light on what Goodyear and our other nine members um, cities do day in and day out to provide water. Collectively, AMWA cities employ more than 2,500 professionals that work tirelessly to ensure that water is available to homes, businesses, and industries throughout the year. Because we provide water to those small businesses and large industries, they are able to be the engine that drives Arizona's $320 billion GDP. What binds the AMWA cities together is that we collectively know the importance that we must continually plan and invest in our water supplies and in our infrastructure. Because of this, we can share the message that even, even though there's a shortage on the Colorado River, there is not a shortage at our taps. It is a miracle what the AMWA cities have achieved, and it all rests on the foundation of smart water policy and management and collaboration. We are proud of what we have contributed the last 50 years, but we recognize that miracles require wise stewardship. Therefore, AMWA is committed to continue to collaborate with Goodyear and with our other member cities so we do our part in sustaining the miracle of water in Arizona. Thank you. Well, thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'm just comments. I'm going to ask the council member, Laura Tano, to make some remarks. Is there anybody else who would like to join?
to just let me know. Warren, I want to thank you for giving the update. I'm rather new to the committee. I know Joanne and then Bill, the vice mayor, sat on it previous. And um, the one thing I find very remarkable is under your stewardship and under AMWAL stewardship, even before you and how you've continued it is how well everybody does work together for the common good. Um, oftentimes when you see that many cities or, or municipalities in any issue, it may stray and you may have people, but everyone is heard and everyone is listened to the subcommittees, their issues, and it's, it's just a very re- breath, refreshing breath um, to see how well everybody works together. So I think that lays a lot at your doorstep on how your organization is run. So thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Kano. Hi, Warren. First, I wanted to thank you for sharing the story about your son, Nathaniel. It's very touching, and it really shows that water is a miracle in many parts of the world, and we are very blessed and very fortunate. I liked how you said how miracles required wise stewardship, and that's very true. I, be, before getting on council, I served on the Goodyear Citizen Water Conservation Committee, and uh, people in Lynn Goodyear are very passionate about water conservation. And, and it is interesting because our ethic is so high that we have not had to impose restrictions, like you said. And so people get concerned that maybe we're not doing enough. And so um, appreciate how you get the message out, the collaboration between the communities. And uh, just thank you for what you do. Thank you. Councilman Campbell, did you say you want to speak? No, no, no. I don't, I don't need to speak. Councilman Pazillo. Uh, I also had the honor of, of serving um, on the committee quite a while ago. And again, I appreciate all the efforts. And, you know, like uh, Council Member Loretano mentioned, you work very, everybody works very well together with ultimate goal to make sure we have water well into the future. So, again, thank you for all you do. It's thank a little you. round of applause for everything they do. Next, we have appointments to the Public Improvement Corporation, which is known as PIC the Youth Commission, and the Fire Public Safety Personnel Retirement Board. Our Deputy City Clerk, Laura Jarrett, will be presenting. And so then after she's finished with them, yes. I'm sorry, Mayor, there's a third communication item. Sorry, what? There's a third communication item. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry, I just don't have it. We have the wrong, wrong uh, little... uh, Yeah. So it's this one right here. So right here. I just read it. That's what I had. That was Mr. Diaz. And water resources planning. City clerk announce the next one up, please. The next item is an update on the Water Conservation Committee recommendations. Water Resources Planning Advisor Ray Diaz will present. Oh, I announced the wrong person. So the next time the mayor announces the wrong person, just stop me, okay, and give me the right name so we can do it. It's the way to do it because I do that once in a while, so I need some care. All right? Thank you. All right, I'm now I need to apologize, Mr. Diaz, because I obviously had the wrong one. So welcome. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Good good, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, Tonight we are here to provide Council with an update on the progress made um, on the Water Conservation Committee recommendations. Uh, If you recall, on May 21st of last year, Public Works staff, along with members of the committee, presented 12 recommendations to you. Council at that time requested that staff provide regular updates on these recommendations. As you will see, a lot of work has already begun uh, on nearly all 12 of the recommendations since the May 21st meeting. This does not mean we have reached the finish line, but rather it is only the beginning. Before we update you on the recommendations, we wanted to recognize once again the hard work that each of the members of the committee put into this effort. It was two years of their time, and we are very grateful for their contributions. We also wanted to mention to you that we did meet with several of the committee members on May 21st of this year to 
provide them updates on the recommendation. All the updates being presented tonight were provided to them. To give a little background, in Goodyear, 60% of residential water use is outdoors. For this reason, the focus of the Water Conservation Committee was to provide recommendations that targeted the, to reduce outdoor water use. Here we see a table showing the 12 recommendations proposed by the committee. They were listed in what the committee felt was the order of priority. Recommendations with highest potential water savings and lowest implementation costs were ranked first. Progress has been made on nearly all of the recommendations. Recommendations in blue are those which are currently moving forward. Yellow are recommendations that research has begun, but additional information and analysis is needed before determining how to best move forward. And those in red are those which have not been addressed at this time. We'll briefly go through each of the recommendations, starting with those highlighted in blue. Landscape design standards. This recommendation alone could help us achieve our future water conservation needs. For that reason, the committee ranked this recommendation first. When we reached out to our engineering department, we were informed that they were already working on updating the design standards and funding was available. We are partnering together and will assist and provide input where appropriate to include water efficient measures into the updates. An RFP was completed and a vendor has been selected. Our first kickoff meeting is scheduled for September 30th of 2019. This recommendation will also incorporate recommendation number three, which is the citywide tree plan. Community education. Staff has attended local events and provided educational material to residents regarding water efficiency. We have recently partnered with the University of Arizona to, pr to promote Project WET program, which aims to educate fourth graders on water resources. We plan on having our own water festival in February of 2020. Lobby displays at City Hall, the Goodyear Library, and Public Works with educational material have been set up to provide water efficient information to, to the public. Our communications team has used social media to regularly send out water Wednesday messaging to encourage greater water awareness and efficiency. We continue to provide free educational classes to the public Classes are held in both fall and spring. We've partnered with a few local HOAs to pilot software that compares calculated water budgets and actual consumption data and found promising results. Customer-friendly services. After evaluating programs within our city, it was determined the city of Goodyear needs a position dedicated to developing, promoting, and focused on water conservation efforts. An existing position within the Water Resources Division has been changed and updated from the Water Demand Advisor to Water Conservation Coordinator. This was a strategic decision. Having a dedicated individual is foundational for successful implementation of many of the services being proposed. The new individual will be, asked, will be tasked with defining what services would be most beneficial for our citizens. The position is currently under recruitment. Small irrigation controllers. We've acquired funding to move forward with a pilot this fiscal year. Staff is currently working on a scope of, for, that, for that pilot. Water intensive exceptions. The committee focus was to provide recommendations to help the city be good managers of their water resources. However, there are those industries that, although use large amounts of water, they do bring tangible benefits to the city. This policy is aimed at addressing that. We have a draft policy and are working with key stakeholders within the city, of, within the city to address any concerns. The key to remember is to have, make a policy that meets council's strategic goal of economic vitality. These are the recommendations we are actively working on and are moving forward. In the essence of time, we will, we will not go into as much detail for the following recommendations, which are in yellow and in red. The recommendations in yellow are ones we have begun research, but need to gather additional data for analysis. We want to ensure the programs make sense for Goodyear. 
For example, a program for front yard turf removal may not be good for Goodyear if we do not have significant amount of parcels with turf in the front yard. Mm -hmm. We want to fund programs that make the most sense for our city. We are reaching out to our surrounding cities to see what they are doing and reviewing how effective their programs are for water savings. The first recommendation in the yellow category is conservation rate structure. Our finance department is in the middle of the rate study and we will become more involved in the process as it moves further along. AMI implementation, public works staff are installing AMI capable meters on every new meter install or any meter being replaced. Further research is needed to determine how best to collect consumption data collected with customer engagement. Landscape incentives. Currently we are evaluating data and information from other local municipalities to determine the most effective incentives. Water main flushing. As part of the integration of our new surface water treatment plant, we are researching the impacts it may have on our existing water distribution system. We are evaluating how flushing fits into the larger strategy in managing the distribution system. Additional research is needed. Irrigation checkups. This program is being evaluated as to whether to perform in-house or outsource the service. The new conservation coordinator position will look further into the program. Those were the updates we had for the recommendations in yellow. The loan recommendation in red is the establishment of a pool committee. The primary focus of staff this, this first year was to focus on those recommendations that were considered to add the greatest immediate value. Creation of a new committee is a time intensive venture mm -hmm. and we want to be sure we can commit appropriate resources to moving it forward. For that reason, we do not have an update at this time on that recommendation. As you can see, progress has been made on nearly all of the recommendations in our first year. We hope to continue the trend and have additional updates for you next year and continuing forward on an annual basis. That completes our update on the recommendations and would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for that briefing. It was well done. Uh, but this is a hot topic, topic among all the council. So I'm just put it back to the dais who has any questions or comments or anything you feel is missing. Councilman Basile, did you have a... No, I was just going to make a comment. Uh, I hear it all the time about conversation for every one gallon we serve, that's one we don't have to get. So any of this that we serve for future use, um, uh, save through uh, the landscaping or whatever it is that you find out we can actually save the water usage is, I think, good long term. So again, I appreciate all the efforts. I appreciate the efforts of our water committee that's come up with a recommendation and just keep moving forward. Thank you. Councilmember Campbell. Well, I wanted to thank the committee for the recommendations. I feel that uh, council, um, I've been on long enough to know that we as a council have actively tried to update the design guidelines for the landscaping part. And I know we have wonderful staff that talks with developers that come in that tell them what we would like to have. And uh, we just, it, it takes all of us working on it to be able to be successful. But thank you so very much. And um, don't lose hope if you don't get all of your uh, suggestions rolling all at once. This is, uh, you know, how government is. It takes us a little while to vent it all out. But thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Kano. Ray, I just want to say thank you for keeping it on the forefront. I know that it was very important to those who served on the committee that, uh, this would go forward and would stay alive and I appreciate everything that you're doing to keep it uh, going moving it forward so uh, look forward to continued updates and and thank you for your support of this councilmember Hampton yes I also want to say thank you to uh, for the committee who put this all together as well I know it was a long process and a lot of hard work went into it so I appreciate all the time and effort that staff and also that committee did and then also I appreciate the um, all, all the all the suggestions I think it'll be uh, exciting to and much needed for our community to implement these changes at, as we can so I do appreciate your time and and help putting this together so thank you yeah uh, the mayor says the same thing it's uh, been pretty extraordinary how many of them really were so uh, dedicated to this committee 
that they didn't want to stop. They wanted to move on to another and on to another. And so uh, we're going to reap the benefits of seeing their accomplishments not too far down the road. And we know it's not, fa- it's not a fast process. And I'm sure some of the citizens often wonder, sometimes just don't understand that. Um, but it has to do with funding, and it has to do with design, and it has to do with all the uh, construction we have going on in the city. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Yes. All right, so now I'm back on. So now I'm back on to uh, what I've already said, but I'll just say it one more time. Uh, Next, we have appointments to the Public Improvement Corporation, the Youth Commission, and the Fire Public Safety Personnel Retirement Board. Deputy City Clerk Laura Jarr will present, and we will vote afterwards, and then she'll do an oath. We have the floor. Good evening, mayors and members of council. Uh, The city council subcommittee boards, commissions, and committees reviewed applications, conducted interviews, and has made the recommendation to reappoint to the Public Improvement Corporation, Michael DeLeo and Kuweth Ewell, and to reappoint to the Youth Commission, Patrick Mackey. The fire department members held an election and selected fire member Patrick Doyle to serve on the Fire Public Safety Personnel Retirement Book. Retirement board. All right. All right. So I'm going to have to have, after that's been presented, I need a motion and a second to approve the recommended appointments. Do I hear that motion? So move. Second. All right. I heard a motion by Councilman Campbell and a second by Councilman Hampton. Um, any discussion? All right. Let's vote for all in favor. Say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. It's over back to you, Deputy City Clerk. Uh, may I please have Patrick Mackey and Patrick Doyle come up so that I can swear you in. I state your name. Hi, Patrick Doyle. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of the state of Arizona that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same and defend them against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will faithfully and impartially, and will faithfully and impartially discharge, the du- discharge the duties of board member according to the best of, of my ability, so I do affirm. I gather that's all she has. All right, now is the time for citizens who would like to address the City Council on any non-agenda item within the jurisdiction of the Goodyear City Council. Do we have any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Right. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak? All right, let's go on to the consent agenda. At the request of the staff, item number eight has been removed from the consent agenda and will be considered under business. So will the deputy city clerk please read consent agenda items five through seven, nine, ten by title only, please. Item number five, approval of minutes. Number six, approve the fiscal year 2019 and fiscal year 2020 budget transfers. Number seven, approve agreements with the Salt River Valley Water Users Association and the Salt River Project Agricultural Improvement and Power District and authorize and direct the city manager or her designee to take in any and all actions to execute all documents necessary to carry out the intent of these agreements. Number nine, approve expenditure in the amount of 643600 and a related budget transfer for the purchase and installation of a new centrifuge for the Rainbow Valley Water Reclam- Reclamation Facility. Number 10, recommend approval of a Series 12 liquor license for Federico's Mexican food. Thank you. Does anyone in the council wish to move an item from the consent agenda? All right, then let's, could I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. second. I heard a motion by Councilman Stiff and a second by Councilman Loritano. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kino? Aye. Councilmember Pazillo? Aye. Councilmember Loretano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. 
Motion carries. Great. All right. Tonight, there's two public hearings. The first public hearing is an item to approve a request for a use permit for a convenience use KFC drive through restaurant. I'm opening the public hearing. Planning Manager Katie Wilkin will be presenting. Katie? Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. As stated, this request is for a use permit for a convenience use for a KFC restaurant that includes a drive through. Um, the restaurant is proposed to be located at the Canyon Trails Town Center at the very south of the development along Yuma Road. The development is a one acre parcel and will include a 2200 square foot building. The drive through allows for 11 car queuing, which um, far exceeds our standards of five um, vehicles per queuing. The window faces, um, the drive through window faces north into development, and the menu board faces east into the private driveway, which meets our standards. Um, here are elevations. They do meet the materials and color palette for the Canyon Trails Town Center development. These are the north and south elevations, and then these are the east and the west elevations. The development does still need to go through um, site plan um, design review, which is an administrative process. The development has been found to meet all codes and ordinances. The Planning and Zoning Commission considered this item at their last meeting. There were no members of the public present to speak regarding the request besides the applicant. Therefore, staff recommends approval based on Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation. Thank you very much. Uh, is the applicant here, Juan Salamanca? Yes. Would he yeah. like to come forward? The representative is here. Hello. Hello. I'm a representative for the um, develop the the engineer for the development. Um, I don't have any other comments. If you have questions, I'll try to get an answer for you. All right, all right. Well, we'll see how this vote goes, and you'll be saying welcome in just about a few moments. So you okay. can be seated. The council will call you up. If there's a question. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Then I'm going to close the public hearing. Can I have a motion a second to approve a request for a use permit for the convenient use drive through restaurant to be constructed within the Canyon Trails Town Center PAD located at the northeast corner of Cotton Lane and Yuma Road, subject to stipulations? Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Council Member Kano and a second by Council Member Stiff. Open for Council, I'm sorry, Councilman Pazillo. And you were just waiting for me to do that again. Uh, yes, <laughs> Councilman Campbell. I've got a question. Katie, do you know, is this uh, location going to be a corporate store or is it a local franchisee? I do not know the answer to that. Does, does, does the engineer person know? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting the answer. One moment. Take your time. That's all right. It's kind of an unusual question, so without the applicant here, so. Technology, I'm sorry, all right. it's taking Don't. a moment. Well, let oh, me that's just, okay. Let me just ask the we can council find person. Uh, what, what well, we, we have a, several local businessmen that own a lot of the local franchises, and they're local people. And that's all I wanted to know: is this a local owner? We just had off the hook uh, meat company come in. Uh, the the and it's wonderful. It's a local company. And mm -hmm. uh, when I first moved to Goodyear, 
a long time ago. <laughs> there was a sign that said KFC is going on a certain corner, and then after 10 years, it disappeared. And I don't oh. know if it's the same people coming in or... This is um, this is a local uh, owner. He has one partner in Phoenix and one in Houston. Perfect. We love having local people come with franchise in Goodyear. That's all. We just wanted to say welcome. And when you identify yourself working for the engineer, you won't be back behind the counter when we come in. No, I so- won't. I'm actually working working with my brother-in-law who owns the engineering company. Oh, wonderful. I live here locally, and he lives in Houston. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Tell them how delighted we are they're coming to Goodyear. We've been waiting a long time to have a KFC here. Okay, I'll let them know. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming up. You're welcome. All right. So discussion is ended. All right. Oh, Councilman Pizzillo. No, I just want to echo that. Probably the rest of them do the same thing. Just welcome. Welcome to the city. Ready? All right, let's vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Welcome to Goodyear. I'm looking forward to that one in Goodyear. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. All right. The next public hearing is to approve a request for a use permit for the modifications to an existing convenience use Chick-fil-A drive through restaurant. I'm going to open the public hearing. Planner 3, Steve Karachi presenting. Steve? Good evening, Mayor, Council members. We have a use permit for the existing Chick-fil-A. And this is the site here, Dysert Road, just west of Dysert. It's about 1.3 acres. It's within the Palm Valley Cornerstone Development, which is anchored by Lowe's here. Uh, Zoning for all of this center, it's mixed-use commercial, uh, part of Palm Valley Phase 1, approved in 1989. Uh, site plan for Chick-fil-A 2003. And the owner has indicated to staff, very busy site. They needed modifications to the site to handle all of the volume that they do. Uh, these are some of the modifications that they wanted to do. Uh, some of the ones I'll touch on here are just, they have a single drive through lane now. They'd like to turn that into a double lane. Uh, with that change, though, we'll come with the removal of some parking spaces on the site. We're also going to increase capacity in the restaurant with about a 550-square-foot addition. Uh, Because this is a use permit as defined, um, a convenience use as defined in the zoning ordinance, uh, modifications of this extent did require the applicant to go back through the use permit process. So that's why you have this item before you tonight. And this is the site, the proposed site plan submitted with the use permit. Just wanted to point out, this is the location of the drive-through lane. You can see now the additions will cause two drive-through lanes now to come through. They'll converge then and wrap around the building as they do now. Uh, This is the addition here on the west end of the building here. And so after all this is done, they'll have 39 parking spaces on the site. So they'll be a little short. So they'll have to park, take parking from the rest of the center, but there is a surplus in the center, and there is a shared parking agreement within the center. Uh, this is the existing building. No real changes to the building other than the areas in the red boxes. This is the addition here on that west end. And as you can see, the addition will uh, match seamlessly with the existing architecture of the building. Uh, Because it is a public hearing, we did post and notice the property as required. Uh, Staff did not receive any public inquiries on this request. We have not received any opposition on this request. Uh, Findings, we find it will not be material detrimental to the surrounding area. We find it will be compatible with uses in the surrounding area. Uh, Planning Zone Commission, they heard this at their meeting September 11th. Uh, No opposition at the commission hearing. staff and the Planning Zoning Commission. Uh, We're both recommending approval subject to the four stipulations in the staff report. Uh, That concludes my presentation, Mayor. Uh, Staff's available for for questions. The local owner is here as well, along with his engineer. They're available for questions as well. Yes, would the applicant like to speak? Mayor, they're here for questions if you have any. Hmm. I close. It's not the same guy. Mayor, Lord, and Council, I just want to say thank you for considering this. Um, it'll help us to uh, continue to grow the business and relieve some of the congestion there on Dicer Road. 
Uh, are there any questions that I can answer for you? Thank you. There may be. I don't know that yet. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Are there any speaker cards other than the speaker that just spoke? No, Mayor. Okay. Can I have a motion a second to approve a request for the use permit to allow the building and site modification to an existing convenience Chick-fil-A drive through restaurant and a property zone PAD planned area development mixed use commercial subject st stipulations. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from council member Stiff and a second from council member Hampton. Open for council discussion. Councilman Loritano. I, I just want to say thank you for bringing that forward. You have a very, very successful business and easy. For even how busy it is, you, you move it very quickly and try to relieve the congestion. So thank you for thinking of another idea to keep removing the congestion. The additional 550 square feet and how we will set up the drive through allow us to almost double the capacity through the drive through And you'll still probably be packed. So I think we will be. See. It so, is. Just know that we're looking for additional property in Goodyear. So that's, oh, great. that's good. Councilmember Hampton. Councilmember Hampton. Yeah. I was just say the same thing. I mean, you're very successful there, so it's a good problem to have to to need to expand. And I, my kids and I frequent that very often. And to uh, Miss Loritano, Councilwoman Loritano, it's the point as well. Yeah, we'd love to have another one near Cotton Lane or however wherever you'd like to put it in Goodyear as well. Your naming so, is true. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so thank you very much. It's our pleasure, honestly. Councilman Spazillo. You know, every time I visit your place, it's packed. The people are very courteous, um, so I wish you well. I'm sure what you're doing right now will, will boost your business even more. So, again, I appreciate you being here in Goodyear. Thank you, sir. Anybody else in here? You're all set? All right, so that council discussion is finished, so let's vote on this. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations. We look Thank you, forward council. to uh, seeing less traffic and more more um more buying uh Ticket residents in there for you i know you've been really proud of it <laughs> we'll do our best we've all been in there when the backup when the driveway oh, yeah. is and so i we know you've needed this for a long time so i'm glad i'm glad we could do it thank you again all right all right let's go to the business i'd like to remind council to wait uh, for a motion a second before discussion the first item on the business to consider changing the street name of North 166th Avenue north of Indian School Roads to the UPS Way. Economic Development Pro Project Manager Harry Paxton presenting. Harry? Good evening, Mayor and Council. United Parcel Service, or also known as UPS, has requested that we change the street name that's north of Indian School that leads into their site to the UPS Way. There are several good reasons for this, um, so I wanted to discuss those with you um, this evening. You can see at their site, being at the northeast corner of the Loop 303 and Indian School Road, stretches all the way to Cerebral Avenue as well. It's probably, the, I think it is, the largest site in our city of any employer, 137 acres. You can see there in that um, depiction of their site, the Customer Service Center where they'll have, they provide service to customers that will have domestic as well as international shipments. And so they need to find an easy way to get to the site instead of going over to Cerebral and making a mistake of trying to enter off of that and then being associated with all the trucks that will be over there. So the UPS Way site or name of the street of changing it from 166th Avenue to the UPS Way only north of Indian School Road, which is actually becomes a private drive into their site. Um, for those reasons, and also for electronic navigation for the public of coming into the site, we're proposing to change that name of 166th Avenue north of Indian School Road to the UPS Way. Let's see, how do I change to the next, oops. So this here, I think. Question here. Oops. Anyway, <laughs> there, thank you. 
So as I mentioned earlier, the customer service center will serve the public. The site is 137 acres. The new name does not conflict with any of the existing street names. It is just one private drive basically going north to the site. And the existing property owner of the UPS site, and there's only one property owner of the 137 acres, is in support of this name change. Happy to answer any questions you might have, as well as um, UPS does have a couple of representatives here. Charles Hoover's here, as well as Robert Upton from Would the applicant UPS. like to speak? Or? Welcome. Thank you. Mayor, Council, thank you for your time today. And Robert and I are just here to answer any questions you may have, and, and uh, just thank you for your support. All right, great, thank you. Are there any other speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? All right, will the deputy clerk please read resolution number 2019-1998 by title only, please. Adopt resolution number 2019-1998, authorizing a street name change for North 166th Avenue, north of Indian School Road, located east of the Loop 303 Freeway, to the UPS way in the city of Goodyear, Maricopa County, Arizona, and establishing an effective date. Thank you very much. Can I have a motion, a second, to approve the resolution number 2019-1998? Do you hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Council Member Kano and a second by Councilman Loritano. Open for council discussion. Councilman Hampton. Yeah, it's been exciting to see your building getting complete and building and getting bigger and bigger and getting more and more complete. I saw that you had the uh, now hiring sign on your wall too, which is pretty exciting as well to start that phase of the project. And then, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, it'll be it's appropriate and I think it's a good, a good way to have the UPS way as the street also. I had a question about the, the customer service center. Do you know what the scope? I'm just curious, so when I tell people, should, should a person who just wants to mail something normal go there? Or should it be someone who actually has a small business and trying to do larger scale type type uh, mailings? Uh, good question. No, it, the customer service center is open for anybody who wants to do any kind of shipping or anything at all. Mm -hmm. Almost like the post office, but just with UPS. Mm -hmm. Open to okay. the public. Okay. I just to make sure when I talk to people about, yeah, you can go there. You can, anybody can go there type thing. Yeah, anyone can go. Uh, all right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I think we're very pleased. A uh, number of people keep driving by when, before it was completed and wondering what was going to be built in all that land. Uh, but it looks great. Uh, and I think the idea that we can actually use that uh, during the holiday times to mm -hmm. mail packages and things uh, for that side of, of the city, that it's wonderful. So we're glad you're here. So welcome. And we're going to vote on this now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Roll call. Do I have a roll call for this one? Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp. Aye. Council Member Hampton. Aye. Council Member Kano. Aye. Council Member Pizzillo. Aye. Council Member Loritano. Aye. Council Member Campbell. Aye. Mayor Lord. Aye. Motion carries. All right. Welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. The next item is number eight to consider approving the final plat of Estrella par Parcel 7.1. Katie. Manager of uh, Planning Manager Katie Wilkin presenting again. Katie, maybe we ought to put you in the front seat, Katie. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation for this item. This okay. was the um, item that was on the consent agenda that was pulled. Um, the final plat is a request to subdivide about 20 acres into 80 lots. It's located in the Montecito development at the northwest corner of Estrella Parkway and Calistoga Drive. This is a fairly typical final plat. The reason it was pulled from the consent agenda is that we are requesting the modification of two of the stipulations that were included in the staff report. 
The first modification is to stipulation number one, and we request that that it be struck in its entirety. The stipulation requires a 25% payment on the traffic signal. Now, we're not saying that Newland isn't responsible for the traffic signal payment. It's just the way this is worded conflicts with the zoning regarding the, pay the timing of the payment. So they are required to pay their fair share for the traffic signals, and it is covered by the zoning. So it's not needed in this final plat stipulation. So again, we, requ we request that stipulation number one be stricken. Um, then stipulation two, which would now be stipulation number one, um, part of the property is included within a um, floodplain, and that's subject to the Clomer-Lomer process. Um, so the stipulation requires that um, the Clomer-Lomer plot process um, be um, conformed to before building permits can be issued on the property. However, due to the time it's been taking FEMA to review submittals, um, the applicant requested some relief to this um, requirement and that model homes be allowed to be permitted um, after the CLOMAR has been completed, but before the LOMAR has been completed. The engineering department, development services department, and legal department all reviewed this request and um, agree with the applicant and are supportive of this change. So we would request Request that stipulation number two be um, replaced with the following language that no construction permits for buildings within the platted air property shall be issued until FEMA has issued an approved clomer for the platted property except as follows permits for model homes within lots 16 17 and 18 shall be permitted prior to receipt of an approved clomer no construction permits for buildings on lots 40 48 through 58 61 to 72 and 77 shall be issued until FEMA has issued an approved LOMAR that removes the lots from the existing floodplain. Um, so in summary, staff requests that you approve the final plat for Estrella parcel 7.1 with the deletion of stipulation number one and the modification to stipulation two as stated by staff. Very good. So is this motion that we have here, uh, carry that in when I say, can I have a motion a second to the final plat for Australia, partial 7.1 subject to stipulations. Does that cover it? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I'm just saying, does, mm -hmm. this is what he has here, I wanna know, do we add? add? Yes, so you can, so you can word, make your motion amended subject, amended stipulations. Subject to the amended stipulations. Subject stipulation. to amended stipulations. So let me read that in. Can I have a motion and second to approve the final plat for Astoria, partial 7-1, subject to what was the word? <laughs> amended stipulations. Do I hear a motion? I move. Second. I heard a motion by Council Member, uh, Council Member Campbell and a second by Councilman Pazillo. Open for Council discussion. Councilman Stiff. Katie, it's the... Uh, FEMA requirements part of the U.S. navigational waterways. I, I don't remember the, the connection. Does anybody? I need assistance. And the reason that I'm asking that question is there's rumor that that's going to be significantly modified in the beginning of 2020. Um, so the FEMA process essentially monitors the floodplain, filling right. in of the floodplain so in this case we're requesting that that information you know those uh permits not be issued and i'm sorry your so question. if the i realize it's a floodplain issue but is it a floodplain because of the navigable waters yeah the navigable waterways <laughs> holy smokes is this is there a correlation between this property and that there is a correlation so mm -hmm. if the federal government were to significantly overhaul and yeah, or almost effectively strike it and not make this a re where this no longer is required, have we wand ourselves into a into a jam by requiring this? I mean, if it, if it no longer is required. You know what I'm saying? And again, I apologize. I don't know the change that you're referring to. What we're saying on this particular one, if I could maybe without a map present. So um, of the 80 lots, I'm going to say that there's approximately 30 that are in the floodplain. Mm. 
So the CLOMER is a conditional letter of MAP provision that essentially talks about and explains the grading that's going to take place to bring those 30 lots out. That <coughs> needs to be approved, um, has been approved by us, and it's been passed on to FEMA. They're in the process of reviewing that document right now. I've had a, a few outstanding questions that they're getting for clarification. The three model homes that have been requested by Newland are actually outside of the floodplain, so they're in one of the 50. So this essentially doesn't impact that at all. Then as we move forward, the LOMER, which is actually once the grading's taken place, you do a survey on that grading, and then you submit that in support of your LOMER, and now it's a letter of MAP revision. <coughs> and so that essentially puts in place what's happened and you're validating it. So I'm not sure if any changes in the future would affect that at all because that's an existing, would then be an existing condition. Okay. I, so the only reason that I was asking for Pete, because I see him struggling <laughs> around the post there, I just wanted to make sure that we weren't going to do anything that was going to prohibit you later if something went away. Um, I'm in support of the whole thing. I, I think moving forward is the best thing to do to keep the wheels of progress moving along while we wait for the federal government to kind of get it together. So you've answered my question. I just wanted to make sure we weren't unnecessarily holding ourselves or this project down. Uh, and thank you for that clarification. However, I don't believe that this would change in any way. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. So basically, it would not most likely be any delays. No. This is uh, actually allowing him to move, uh, Newland to move forward ahead of schedule. All right. Great. Any other discussion? Excuse me? Any other discussion over here to the right? Okay, well, let's vote on it then. All in favor say aye. 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 Oppose? The ayes have it. All right, let's go down to number 14 on business to consider approving a preliminary plat for Prologis Commerce Park at Goodyear. Planner 3, Steve Correccia will present. Steve? Mayor Council, we have a preliminary plat before you tonight. It's about 112 acres here. Yuma Road, Bullard, uh, Goodyear Phoenix Airport. A lot of development coming in around this development. So the applicant is moving forward with plans to develop this with industrial development. Uh, zoned I-1, light industrial, that was back in 2018. A site plan for five building industrial development that was approved just this year. Uh, what the applicant would like to do now is subdivide this 112 acres into five lots and one track, again, to facilitate the industrial development of this parcel. And this is basically the layout. Here's Bullard, here's Yuma, and you've got the five lots that they would like to develop. Uh, staff, we do find it consistent with property zoning, with our subdivision regulations, uh, provide for the continued orderly development of the area. Uh, Planning and Zoning Commission did hear this item at their September 11th meeting. Uh, no opposition. Uh, they did vote to forward a recommendation of approval to the council. Uh, as such, staff and the commission, we are recommending approval subject to the six stipulations in the staff report. Uh, includes my presentation, Mayor. Staff is available for questions. The applicant is here as well. All right, thank you. I understand that Jack, Jake Early is here with Hunter and Engineering. Does he want to say anything? Good evening, Mr. Early. Hello, Mayor and Council. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to stand here in front of you. Uh, I was the civil engineer that prepared the preliminary plat for this project. And if there's any questions, be happy to answer. Thank you. As soon as they uh, do a motion, I'll ask them if they have any questions. So thank you very much for coming forward. Any other uh, people in the audience like to speak? All right, then I can I have a motion a second to approve the preliminary plat for Prologis Commerce Park at Goodyear subdividing 112.38 acres into five lots and one track, generally located at the northeast corner of Bullard Avenue and Yuma Road, subject to stipulations. Do I hear a motion? Second. I hear a motion from Council uh, from Vice Mayor Stiff 
uh, get it once time in the meeting. And a second from Councilman Fazil. Open for council discussion. No, Councilman Hampton. I just had a question about access for the road there. Does that, does the west side of that property touch the road that goes from Michael Lewis down to mm -hmm. Yuma? Or is there still space there? I see like a cul-de-sac here, but I wasn't sure if it touched it or not, if it went that far. It's hard to see. I know we're building a lot, so it looks like farmland in the presentation, but it's not farmland anymore. Mayor, council members, the site will have access from all three roadways. Mm -hmm. So for long here, and again, as you notice, this cul-de-sac here from 143rd. Okay. Okay, thank you for, now I see it here. It was turned away, I don't know, in the other presentation. I didn't notice it, so, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, any other questions? All right, let's vote on. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it, thank you very much. Uh, the next item of business is number 15, approving a preliminary plat for Australia parcel 9.28. And Katie Wilkin is back again. Thank you again, Mayor, members of the council. This is a preliminary plat that proposes subdividing approximately 18 acres into 64 residential lots. It's located in the Montecito development of Estrella, um, northwest of Willis and 181st Avenue. The proposal includes um, minimum 50 foot wide lots and 24 foot percent open space this development um, let's see just so you know it is dependent upon the next preliminary plat parcel 9.3 to provide its secondary emergency access mm -hmm. so it'll come in here so there is a stipulation stipulation number one which requires that this preliminary plat cannot be recorded until parcel 9.3 is recorded because that parcel 9.3 provides the secondary emergency access The preliminary plat does meet all Goodyear codes and ordinances. The Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? I'd like a motion and a second to approve the request for a preliminary plat approval for Australia Parcel 9.28, subject to stipulation. Do I hear that motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Councilman Lortano and a second by Councilman Hampton. All from council discussion. All right, let's vote on it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. All right, let's go to item 16. It's to consider approving the preliminary plat for a sterling parcel 9.30. And Katie Wilkin, planning manager, presenting once more. <laughs> Thank you. As I stated in the last presentation, this parcel is located just next to the one we just discussed. Mm -hmm. It includes about 15 acres, which will be subdivided into 62 residential lots. Um, similar lot design, 50 foot wide <laughs> lots. This um, preliminary plat includes 19% open space. And as I stated before, this provides the connection to the parcels to the east mm -hmm. um, there. This preliminary plat also meets all codes and ordinances and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval. Thank you. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? And can I have a motion a second to approve a request for the preliminary plat approval for Australia parcel 9.30 subject to stipulation. Do I hear that motion? To move. Oh. I heard a motion second. from Vice Mayor Stiff and who seconded it? <laughs> Councilman Campbell. Second, so open for council discussion. No discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. Okay. All right, the next item 17 is to consider adopting amendments to the Goodyear City Code Chapter 11 and Article 1-8 regarding vaping regulation, restrictions and penalties. City Attorney Rorick Massey will be presenting. Rorick. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the, evening, the item you have before you this evening is a follow-up to the vaping presentation. You had a work session on September 9th, a couple weeks ago. It was presented to you by uh, Assistant City Attorney Donna Bronski, uh, Chief Geyer, and Deputy Chief Hughes. You had a pretty significant policy discussion 
and review of the proposed ordinance at that point uh, gave some policy direction. Uh, with that, we're going to present the ordinance for formal consideration this evening. Um, it's, it's a rapidly uh, evolving subject. I, I've been monitoring the news over the last couple of weeks since we even had the work session. It seems like every day we read another story about uh, public health concerns being associated with vaping. Uh, a couple of states I noted have uh, moved moved towards regulating even the uh, the flavored nicotine that's uh, going into these devices so uh this is a timely discussion on on the part of the council to have uh the action you're going to have this evening uh, amends our 2002 non-smoking ordinance now back in 2002 uh you may recall you went you could go into a restaurant and ask for smoking or non-smoking section uh, Goodyear was on the leading edge of uh, communities that began regulating that when we couldn't get a statewide regulation in place. And a couple of, a couple of years later, uh, the state did finally pass the uh, non-smoking ordinance. And that was actually one of the first projects I worked on here in, this, in the city, back with uh, Councilmember Sue Linney. I didn't need my reading glasses back then. Uh, <laughs> but basically, walking through the ordinance, uh, what it actually does is we're incorporating uh, vaping, uh, both the devices and the action of vaping into our non-smoking ordinance. So we're, we're prohibiting the use of those products in, in public places, uh, restaurants, places of employment. Uh, we're also incorporating a restriction upon the use or possession of vaping and vaping products in our schools, uh, partially in response to the concerns that the uh, education community has expressed to the council that began this discussion a few months ago. Um, also incorporating the, a restriction on the use in public parks. Um, generally, those are the major changes uh, to the non-smoking ordinance. We've also added provisions that would restrict the use of vape and vaping products in city facilities and city vehicles. Uh, we had a previous restriction on the use of uh, those of smoking uh, in city and city vehicles. Makes sense to go ahead and incorporate vape, vaping into those restrictions as well. We're also uh, requiring that retailers uh, check for IDs, and they're prohibited from selling, uh, actually smoking, cigarette smoking, and vaping products to anyone under the age of 21. And retailers in the city of Goodyear will be required to check, physically check an ID before they make any sale of those types of products, um, should this ordinance be approved by council this evening. Um, <clears throat> Generally, a violation of those, those restrictions will be uh, a petty offense. So it's not a civil offense like a speeding ticket. It's not a misdemeanor, uh, but it's kind of in the middle. But there will be mandatory fines, uh, 100 for a first offense. There's always surcharges imposed on top of that, about 86%. Uh, 200 for a second offense, 300 for a third offense, with the exception of the retailer uh, section. Uh, following our work session, uh, it was presented as misdemeanors for selling uh, those products to minors or to those under the age of 21. In response to council concerns uh, expressed that we make those penalties more significant, uh, we have presented the ordinance tonight with mandatory minimums of $500 for a first offense, 1000 for the second offense, and 2500 for a third offense that occurs within 24 months. That would be for the individual who actually uh, makes a sale in violation of the ordinance. Uh, there are also provisions that we can treat businesses as an enterprise. Our city code does give us some authority to regulate an enterprise differently. Uh, that has also been incorporated into the ordinance to give us an option uh, should we have a repeat offender that is a uh, commercial enterprise that would provide that you could impose a fine of up to $20,000 for repeated violations of the, of the ordinance. Um, with that, I, I think we previously noted in the work session that under Arizona law, it is already illegal for a minor under the age of 18 to possess or to sell to a minor. This ordinance is uh, intended to kind of address that gap of 18 to 21, um, and that does address the sale. And with that, I would note again, uh, this is does contain an emergency clause. The intent is the ordinance would be immediately effective. Uh, we are going to undertake a 90-day education piece where we would not be <clears throat> actively enforcing it. Uh, the police department has put together a public awareness uh, program. I think Chief Dyer is available to kind of outline <coughs> what we're going to do over the next 90 days to make sure the public and those retailers are aware of the new ordinance should it be passed this evening. Uh, with that, I'll be available uh, for questions and follow-up. 
Welcome, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So along with this new ordinance, there will be a communication plan that will educate our community on the particulars of this ordinance. The plan will include our residents and our schools, and will also focus heavily on our retailers. We're still working on some of the details, but the media outreach has already started. Communications have sent out information to the media, and I would expect that outreach will continue over the next couple of days. We'll have information in the November issue of the In Focus to educate our residents. Both communications and PD will conduct proactive educational campaigns through social media and our website. Communications and PD will be preparing a brochure that we will hand deliver to all 37 retailers in the city of Goodyear that sell tobacco or vaping products. And in addition to just delivering it, we will have sit down meetings with management and owners to make sure they understand the particulars of this ordinance, of the ordinance and what their responsibilities are. We also plan on preparing another brochure specifically for school administrators and students. We will visit each of our schools, educate on our school administration, and we'll be holding school educational sessions for students at our high schools and middle schools. Middle school. Um, again, we're still working on some of the particulars, but that is a high level draft of our communication plan. And again, as you heard the attorney say that this will uh, educational plan will be for 90 days before any enforcement takes effect. Any questions on the outreach? Thank you very much. Uh, let's let's get it to the point where they can talk and then we'll ask, stay, stay alert. We're gonna be talking to her, I'm sure. So uh, is there any speaker cards? Yes, Mayor, Alex Nelson. I thank you, council members. I'm sorry, just let me quickly get there. I don't know if you've been before us uh, before, but you're limited to three minutes. The yellow light will let you know you have 20 seconds left to speak. Before you begin to speak, identify yourself clearly by stating for the record your name and if you are a Goodyear resident. I own a business in Goodyear. My name is Alex Nelson. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. So recent events have caused a lot of confusion that I'd like to clear up. Um, there's news tell us over 600 cases involving vaping that is talking about lung disease, and six deaths. What they don't mention and what they're leaving out is that every one of these cases was due to a vitamin E acetate. Vitamin E acetate is a chemical used in homemade black market illegal cartridges to thin the consistency of THC, not nicotine. In fact, over the last 10 years, the number of any lung-related illness due to vaping nicotine or e-cigarettes is zero. The yearly number of deaths from smoking cigarettes, however, is 480,000 a year. So what I'm afraid of this is that we're just criminalizing vaping and it really seems like somebody big and powerful is pushing this initiative. And I think one of the reasons is we took a $7 billion bite out of big tobacco. Um, one of the problems with that lies at the state level. Um, not a lot of people are aware of this, but um, more people are becoming aware of something called the MSA, or the Master Settlement Agreement, of which Arizona entered into on November 23rd of 1998. Now, this agreement states that big tobacco companies would provide yearly payments to the states in exchange for the states dropping lawsuits against them regarding smoking-related deaths and expenses. The amount of money big tobacco would give each state was based off of the sales of cigarettes in that state directly. Now... The other problem is that the states wanted all that money right up front. So they sold bonds based against that money. And now they don't have any way to pay them back because um, cigarette sales started dropping drastically. As people moved to an alternative that was proven to be 95% safer, 95% safer than smoking cigarettes to try and help them quit. Now, you would think that our politicians that we voted in and we pay their salaries to look out for our best interest would be thrilled. So why aren't you? Why are we continuing to criminalize vaping? Now, I have no problem enforcing the laws that we already have, but is all you're going to do is hurt the cells of small companies here in Goodyear that you guys represent. And honestly, what we need to do is increase the fines for children that are caught smoking, increase them to the point to where their parents start paying attention. 
parental accountability is one of the biggest problems we have in this nation right now. Everybody just passes the buck. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> Increase the fines for children caught smoking or vaping until the parents do start to notice. And I am a retail owner of a vape store, and I fully support increasing the fines on vape stores that get caught selling to youth and increase them and increase them and increase them until they start paying attention. That's what I'd ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other speaker cards? No, Mayor. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, will the, Dep uh, will the Deputy City Clerk please read resolution number 2019-1994 by title only, please. Adopt resolution number 2019-1994 declaring as a public record that certain document entitled Amendment to Goodyear City Code Chapter 11 Offenses and Chapter 1 Article 1-8 Penalty related to vaping regulations, restrictions, and penalties dated September 2019. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second to approve resolution number 2019-1994? Do I hear that motion? Moved. Second. Is that council yeah. Councilman Campbell made a motion. Second was Councilman Pazillo. Open for council discussion. Councilman Pazillo. A question for the chief. Hi, Chief. I, I, I think uh, a key to all this, too, is your outreach program. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, a parent of um, a, st a person who has a student at a middle school and was unaware of the number of vaping calls that are going to uh, the high schools and the grade schools and et cetera. Uh, was unaware of it, but the student was well aware of it. <laughs> okay. That seems to always be the case. The student knows what's going on. Parents don't know what's going on. Uh, my concern is always to keep it out of the hands of the kids. And I know some of the issues have been things being added to the actual stuff that goes into the actual machines themselves. But again, there's so many knockoffs out there. I would prefer to try to keep it out of their hands. And that's pretty much, in my view, what this ordinance is doing. It is keeping out of the hands of the kids. Because if you raise it to 21, those at 21, all right, don't necessarily hang out with those at eight, uh, 17, 16, and 14, as opposed to those 18 that may end up getting it, sharing it with their siblings, with those that are 14, 15, and 16. So the goal for me is to keep it out of the hands of the kids, all right? From an adult standpoint, when you're over 21, you make your own decisions. But I still think at some point they're going to have to look at some of these knockoffs that are out there that people are putting these things inside these, this equipment itself. So uh, I think the outrage is important. Uh, I don't know how difficult it would be, uh, especially for those that are tampering or, or putting things inside these vapes to get somebody who's had these issues to speak in front of these kids. Because it's always when you're speaking to uh, teenagers or young teenagers, who are they going to listen to? Are they going to listen to you? Are they going to listen to me? Are they going to listen to somebody who's experienced something that was not very pleasant? So I think it's really important to try to get that message out there to the schools and to the parents uh, to get it out of the hands of the kids. Uh, and uh, I wish you luck on figuring out how to go about getting them to listen to that. Because if I'm mistaken, you've had hundreds of calls annually at the schools regarding vaping instances. Is that correct? Yes. There was about 150 at our three schools. Okay. Yes. And uh, that I'd rather, rather get down. And I'd rather be proactive here. I realize there's some that are issues. In fact, there's some states that have already uh, gone to the next step on these. Uh, and there has been some health issues as a result of adding some of these chemicals to these pieces on there. But to me, it's a st I think the state at some point is going to have to step up and uh, bring this, this whole thing home. But until that happens, I would rather be proactive and try to keep it out of the hands of the kids. Uh, and then hopefully the cities can work with the state to ad address those issues. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else on this side? Yeah. Laura? Kano? Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, this came to our attention through the uh, meetings with you and hearing from the SROs about all the vaping calls at school. And I was just curious about, uh, I don't know that we ever talked about it, about these various devices when they're uh, caught at school with them. Do we, are they confiscated? I mean, are, because uh, is there is possession an issue with these, these uh, devices? Yeah, so if it's just tobacco or flavoring, the school will handle these cases administratively. Um, when it comes to THC, Mm -hmm. or other legal substance, that's when the SROs will get called in. We will make an arrest um, on the student, yes. And they'll, and they'll receive school sanctions, too. Okay. Thank you. 
Councilman Canville. Well, Chief, I want to thank you for bringing the ordinance forward. We have really talked a long time about this and thought about it, and the school principals came to us and asked us to do something. They're losing hundreds of hours of an instructional time, and it is uh, an epidemic right now in our schools. And this is why we're moving forward with it. I understand uh, it's going to be um, a challenge to communicate to everyone the new rules, but it sounds like your plan uh, is very well thought of and it's going to be able to be implemented. The schools will certainly cooperate with us because they're the ones that are asking for help so desperately. And um, like Council Member Pizzillo said, we want to keep it out, keep the vaping out of the younger children's hands. I've heard in, in the last couple of days, younger children, even in elementary school, trying it because big brother or big sister has it and they want to see what it's like. And it is, it is something that we need to step forward because right now the legislature isn't acting on it. We need to act now to save our city and to save our kids. Councilman Lord Tom. I want to thank the chief and the city attorney and the city manager and everyone involved and our mayor and this council for coming forward on this issue. Um, I'm a mom, as I've said, of two high school kids, and we've talked about this. You know, there's junior and there's sophomore. And the kids know who's getting it. The kids know which stores will sell to them. They are quite clear. My son said, Yeah, everybody knows it's I'm not gonna say it out loud, it's this store. Um, and so they know. So I think there's some congratulations that this has now become, it's a health crisis in our kids. This is nicotine. This is a substance. This is a carcinogen that young children are sucking into their lungs. I know there's been, the flavor has been, um, the federal government's looking to ban that. Walmart's taking it off their shelves. CBS, Viacom, Warner Media, no one, they're stopping advertising. You're seeing effects of these um, substances on people that are really young. And it took us, you know, decades in many cases to see all the causes that cancers and everything that was tied to smoking. So I really do appreciate this. There's some areas I would like to see stronger. Um, I think the goal here is to keep it out of the kids. And then the other goal is to keep it out of the parks, to keep it off the trails, because there is secondhand smoke. When my daughter came to me when we first talking about this, I asked her about this, and she's 14. She said, yeah, Mom, there's some bathrooms. I don't feel comfortable going in in school because kids are vaping, you know? And I don't care what they're vaping. She shouldn't have to not be able to go to the restroom because kids are smoking, whether it's the flavored stuff or whatever. Um, so I do appreciate those retailers who, the large ones like Walmart, that aren't going to be selling some of those flavor because that's what attracts the kids. I was also really concerned the presentation that you gave to us that shows some of the devices that these kids are using to vape, a lipstick tube, a, you know, a, a, a flash drive, a hoodie that you can suck it in and no one can see. There's n And you could buy that on Amazon. I looked to see if you could buy that on Amazon. They don't ask for your age for that. Mm -hmm. So this is bigger than what we can do. I think we're making a great proactive first step. Um, and I do appreciate that. I think it's a good step for, you know, to keep our children safe and to keep our community safe um, from the second or third hand smoke that we don't even know the effects of that yet. I would challenge and I would love to see our legislature act because our boundaries only go so far. We are so close to our neighboring cities. This has to be a regional, if not a statewide effort. Um, so hopefully when they're in session that we will see some it's a public health crisis. We'll see the governor act or we'll see our legislature act um, to control this, um, to keep it out of the kids statewide because that's what's important. So thank you very much for your leadership, Chief. Any other comments? No comments here? Well, you know, I, the thing about it is, is that, you know, if we talk about medication, all right, so there's all kinds of testing. It's all kinds of, it goes through stages. And even then we end up with opioids. Mm -hmm. So this just gives those people that make their living off of taking something that is probably good and simple and turning it into something that's damaging physically and mentally. So I, I am, you know, I, I am sympathetic to, uh, to business rights of opening up a business and, and that's how they prosper. Um, 
that it does sort of uh, have a little edge to it for me. It's not saying I, I'm not sympathetic to that. I am. But uh, there are products that are invented day after day, year after year, that are good products, yeah. and they do well, and they don't have any problems. And then we have the ones that have problems. It seems to be medication, cigarettes, uh, you know, marijuana, you name it. Um, and we just keep uh, infesting something into the public. Um, and it costs cities. Uh, you, it costs money. And it costs health care. So no matter what they say about any of this, they end up either in the hospital or behind a doctor or in jail or something. And so I just think when I saw one walk into the city hall and I came in and this kid was smoking it, and you would have think, that he was smoking a smokestack, the amount of fumes Smoke. that came out of that. And I, it happened a long time, and I gave him my best stare down, and he took it and ended up putting it in a cuff of his pants or something. He got rid of it really quickly. But you forget you came in a while I, from the uh, park one day telling us all the cartridges were passed around. Yeah. So if people would not throw things out in the street, if they would dispose of them, that would be fine. But look at our highways. We have the loaded with things on the highway, coming out of trucks, going out of windows. People go to the park. They have the pails there. Nobody throws it in. The, they just throw it. And especially, you know, um, many of them just don't care. They don't think about that. So I think it's our job to keep our city pristine. Mm -hmm. And uh, where we can help, uh, we're going to help. And so I'm glad this came before us. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. So no more discussion? All right. Let's vote on it. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Council Member Pizzillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Ha Council Member Hempton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. Okay. So I'm confused again. So I'm going to adopt ordinance 2019 now. Right. Thank you. Go ahead, City Clerk. Adopt ordinance number 2019-1449, amending chapter 11 offenses and chapter 1, article 1-8, penalty of the Goodyear City Code related to vaping regulations, restrictions, and penalties, and providing for penalty, penalties, repeal of conflicting ordinances and codes, corrections, severability, and declaring an emergency. Thank you. Can I have a motion, a second, to adopt ordinance number 2019-1449? Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Councilman Bazillo and a second by Vice Mayor Stipp. Open for council discussion. I think we pretty much did that. Roll call vote, please. Vice Mayor Stipp? Aye. Council Member Campbell? Aye. Council Member Hampton? Aye. Council Member Kano? Aye. Council Member Pazillo? Aye. Council Member Loritano? Aye. Mayor Lord? Aye. The motion carries. All right, so let's go to the next item of business to consider approving the community paramedicine pilot yes. program for the United Healthcare. Fire Chief Paul, Fire Chief Paul Luisi presenting. Paul? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here tonight to discuss a grant opportunity for a community paramedicine pilot pro program. To refresh your memories, community paramedicine is a program in which the paramedics go out and proactively visit our patients that are using the 911 system for non-emergent needs. So those are the high utilizers of that system. This new opportunity with United Healthcare has evolved from many conversations with hospital executives, our previous success that we've had, and many conversations with health, this health insurance. Previously in 2016, I outlined and reviewed an innovative grant opportunity with Vitalis health partners, which provided funding to enhance services to our most vulnerable populations. This new community paramedicine pilot program allows the regional partners of Goodyear, Peoria, and Surprise to focus on a much more broader healthcare issue while uh, directly improving medical and public health systems. The community paramedicine regional pilot program with United Healthcare is a $175,000 service agreement. We anticipate the funding to last one calendar year. Approval of this revenue contract will allow the city to continue providing an evolving model of community-based health care. 
This model will be one in which the emergency responders facilitate the appropriate use of healthcare resources. Goals are our, of the program are very similar to our last pilot program, providing resources to our most vulnerable populations, proactively visiting our high frequency non-emerging users of the 911 system, regional collaboration to maximize healthcare resources, reducing 911 calls and effect reduction in admissions to the hospital, provide effective resources for the patients to use. The cost of the salaries and other operational expenses for this pilot project will be funded by United Healthcare uh, through the grant with the city of Peoria. Tonight, we are asking you to vote to authorize the city manager to execute the IGA with the city of Peoria for the provision of community primary services. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? Then can I have a motion and a second to authorize the city manager to execute an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Peoria for the provisions of the community paramedicine services. Do I hear a motion? Second. I was hoping you were going to move that one. That should be yours to, to say a motion to. Motion made by uh, Vice Mayor Stipp and a second by Councilman Pazillo. Open for council discussion. Yes, Councilman Campbell. So, Chief, will you tell us how this is going to work within our, our department? Is it going to be an off-duty fireman that will be on the crew, or have we? Uh, are we going to hire specific uh, EMTs or paramedics to go out? I mean, in what vehicle are we going to use, and how many days a week are we going to do this, and are we refined only to Goodyear, or are we going to be responding to Peoria and Surprise? Yes, um, this is going to be uh, current employees, paramedics that have been specially trained for this program. Uh, they will work in concert with the uh, surprise firefighters, paramedics, and also Peoria. Uh, the vehicle will be up three days a week uh, from 9 to 5 during those time frames. As I said, it will run for a year. And our goal is to see as many of our patients in all three of the cities who meet our definition of high utilizers three or more times in a month calling the 911 system or 12 or more times in a year calling the 911 system. So we've been um, going through our databases uh, over the last week to pull out those patients and start making uh, appointments with them. So it's more of a proactive visit prior to them calling 911 again. Thank you, Chief. I know this program is wonderful and it's very useful and I have actually was at someone's home when the community paramedicine came when we had it. And it was amazing the level of comfort that they gave that patient who was elderly and was not sure what to do and how to do it. Um, it's interesting, too, because we're so grateful that United Healthcare has taken this because uh, collectively there's been a group of us that have been trying to find some type of funding to continue this because it's so important, we think, to our community. And uh, I want to thank you. You're going to be presenting this for us at our MAG meeting on Thursday and explain the program. So I, I just think it's a wonderful program, and I'm so glad that we're able to partner with Surprise and, and Peoria. Yep. Any other comments? All right. So um, discussion is finished. Let's vote on it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Chief. We're all looking forward to that program. Oh, it's wonderful. The next item is number 19, is to consider approving the amendment 8 to 8 to the intergovernmental agreement with the Regional Public Transit Authority to implement a two-year pilot program for ride choice. So we have Administrative Services Supervisor Christina McMurdy. Hello, Christina. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Back in June, we came to you with a work session about Dial-A-Ride, and we talked about a new service that's being offered by Valley Metro called Ride Choice. With your approval, we'd like to enter into an intergovernmental agreement to participate in a two-year pilot program that will bring Ride Choice to all of our City of Goodyear ADA certified residents. So back to June, it's, um, this is a, a pretty new option, but a few cities have had this program in place since July. So Valley Metro has learned a few things about it, and uh, I think this is a, a great time for us to, to join in. Um, it's run by Valley Metro. It's a contract. Valley Metro has a contract with a logistics company, 
and they're the ones that make all the, the arrangements for our ADA certified residents. To make a reservation, you call one phone number. That same phone number is used to check on your ride, to cancel your ride, to find out the status of your driver. It's a very efficient way to, um, to operate the system. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including holidays. And then um, the, the, when you call to make your arrangements, you uh, take care of your financial transaction over the phone. So you're not paying your driver a ticket or any kind of uh, cash at the time of the transportation. Since June, there's been a really great new development with this program. Valley Metro is now implementing a pilot program of their own that is introducing a mileage option. You can choose your trips two ways now. The standard program is a per trip program. And again, back to June, you're allowed 20 trips per month, up to 50 if you're going to work, medical, or school. Those 20 trips, you're talking about $3 a trip. And then once you uh, exceed an eight mile uh, distance on your trip, then you're paying another $2 for each additional mile. That's the per trip option. That's the standard ride choice program that everybody uh, is gonna be enrolled in if they are ADA certified. The new option that Valley Metro uh, introduced because they've had some experience with passengers in Mesa and, and some of the larger cities in the East Valley is now allowing for a 400 mile per month uh, um, limit. So you can go longer trips for $3. You're not adding on that additional $2 once you get past eight miles. You're allowed 400 miles a month, which is gonna help a lot of our folks out that live in Australia. And then at the end of the month, your unused miles do not carry over. They start over again the following month. So if you only use 200 miles in a month, the next month, the first day of that next month, you start with a fresh 400 miles. Um, what they're finding out is that people that are using the per trip option are taking shorter trips. And a lot of people that are ADA certified don't have to go very far. But the people that really need this are for us, folks in Australia, folks um, out on the, well, West Goodyear is gonna, is, is gonna help a lot of people out there. And those are actually the people I've heard of from the most. Uh, and, and if you remember the night that we introduced this program back in June, we had uh, Mr. Strasser here with his mom. I, I contacted him last week and he was so excited to hear that this is now an opportunity. Um, and he had a whole bunch of questions that we took care of and is, he's all set to go. So it's, it's a great opportunity. Now you can't go to Vegas. Um, you have to stay within Maricopa County, which is still great. And then uh, it, the whole thing, the mileage option is going to make the program a lot more affordable for a lot of folks and a lot more flexible, which is really what we were hoping was going to happen. So the most important requirement of the program is you have to be ADA certified. And there are currently in Goodyear 25 to 30 people who are already ADA certified they are automatically now enrolled in Ride Choice. They're all getting a letter from Valley Metro that went out last week that lets them know that Ride Choice is coming to Goodyear, that it's gonna be effective October 1st, and that they will be receiving a startup package in the mail from the logistics center that gives them an idea of how the program works. But for those folks, and we know that there's probably quite a few that are not ADA certified yet, there's going to be a one-day assessment center this Wednesday um, at the Adelante Healthcare Center that was set up by Valley Metro, not just for Goodyear residents, but for all Southwest Valley cities, that is gonna take them through the same ADA assessment process that they would get if they went to the Valley Metro Mobility Center. Um, there's about 20 to 25 appointments, and as of this morning, only five of them have been booked, so there's plenty of appointments available. Um, if folks can't get to the one-day assessment center in Goodyear, that mobility center option is available five days a week, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. It is in Phoenix, but the transportation to the mobility center and from the mobility center is free. So it's, it's pretty easy to get yourself there. And it's a pretty thorough assessment. I've been in touch with a few folks that have talked about it. Um, you really are taken through a pretty uh, extensive process to determine just what your limitations are for using transit, and that's train and bus. 
So after certified, your ADA and or your, I'm sorry, if you're after your ADA is certified, you're automatically enrolled in Ride Choice. You get a welcome packet. It has all the instructions, but people can still call that phone number and ask for help. And anybody that is already ADA certified and is getting that letter from Valley Metro will have to call that phone number anyway to provide their uh, financial information so that they can be charged for their ride. And that's credit cards, or you can do it direct from your checking account. So we're asking you to approve this amendment to our IGA um, after the first year. Well, I get a weekly report from Valley Metro that shows me all of our dial-a-ride passengers' trips, and they will show me all of our ride choice passengers. So I will be able to monitor on a weekly basis just how many folks from Goodyear are using ride choice, and I'll be able to bring that information back to you um, on some basis. Um, but it's effective October 1st with your approval. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? So, think so. Can I have a motion a second to authorize the city manager to approve the Transit Services Amendment 8 between the City of Goodyear and the Regional Public Trans Transit Authority to implement a two-year pilot ride choice program in Goodyear and authorize a budget transfer of $200,000 from the Park and Ride Marquee Fund balance to pay for the first year of the two-year pilot program. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion from uh, Vice Mayor Stiff, and I think it was from Councilman Kano was the second. So open for council discussion. Councilman Lortano. Uh, thank you. I really happy to live with Australia. I think that's a great second option. I, I do like that, so thank you for coming forward with that. What exactly does the assessment entail? It's the uh, ADA assessment is federally mandated, so it's a federal guideline. There's a whole bunch of uh, bus service right now is ADA compliant. Bus stops are required to be ADA compliant. What the ADA assessment is doing is determining whether you can navigate a bus stop and boarding a bus and whether you'll be able to make that trip from where you're coming from to where you're going. So it's not just physical uh, that it's looking at. It's also looking at a number of capabilities, whether that's um, uh, any kind of behavioral issues you might have, anything like that, they're going to run through the whole gamut. If you, if they determine, let me give you an example. I've been in touch with a resident that lives in West Goodyear uh, about a number of different things, but she sent me the letter that she received today that said that she is has limited ADA eligibility. What they determined is that in a scooter, she was so uh, she was nimble enough or able enough to get around the mobility center um, exercise, which you can see at the bottom right hand corner. That village is set up so that it's got colors that you need to recognize. It's got uh, infrastructure issues you might encounter, whether at a bus stop or just on a street. And it was because she is able to board a bus on her scooter and be able to navigate the bus stop that there are some conditions she can't meet that allows her to be ADA. She can use dial ride under certain conditions, but not all conditions. And how does that work for like up in Straya Cantamia where there, there's no transit to maneuver because we don't have any up there? Correct. So, and that's actually the biggest reason that we wanted to bring this program forward. We are not reaching all the people that we really need to get around. Um, in Australia, we do still have a design guideline. I think there are some bus stops up there. If we were ever to introduce bus service, I don't think we'd be doing that anytime soon. But yeah, if we have we no bus did, service. <laughs> um, that they would assess whether somebody would be able to get on the bus or not. But the whole assessment process now with Ride Choice and Goodyear is so that they can determine whether, if there was bus service, whether they would be able to navigate that system. And this also applies to, to light rail. And again, the same person I was speaking to today, she asked me if she should sign up for a platinum uh, choice, which is a if you are ADA eligible, it allows you to ride the transit system, not dial ride, but the transit system for free. So what they're saying is, yes, we know you have physical limitations or some other type of limitation, but if you feel like you are confident enough to trans travel on the transit system, Here's the pass that you need. You can do it for free. So somebody that is going to use ride choice 
in this case, this person, she could take ride choice from Canyon Trails, let's just say the Target, to Pebble Creek Parkway and McDowell, where the 17 bus stops. That's about eight miles right there, or six miles. And then she could board the 17 and take that somewhere, anywhere along McDowell Road for free. So she's basically paying $3 to get from her house further into the city of Phoenix. It's going to introduce a lot of mobility options for a lot of people. Vice Mayor Christine, thank you very much for the work on this. Um, we are very fortunate to have you um, as, we, even with the limited amount of public transportation that we have, your understanding of the Valley Metro system is just astonishing. And having been on the Valley Metro Board of Directors for the last year or year and a half, um, we are in so much stronger position as a city because of Christine than, than uh than most of our other counterparts who have much larger bus systems than we do. Uh, Christine is very, very strong at what she does. Um, so thank you for this. I know um, navigating Valley Metro can be difficult enough uh, just in general. And then we've got the ADA certification process on top of it. So um, this is a very exciting uh, step forward for us as a community. So um, I just wanted to express my thanks to you and uh, on behalf of everyone. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to punt this back to him because um, you. I was listening earlier to the water presentation. It sounds like the AMWA system is is not unlike how we do MAG and Valley Metro. Um, it's it's very interesting to see how such simple questions like in the budget you have an, a line item here that's three hundred thousand dollars and the category is other, and just simply asking what other means can can set off a lot of change and that's what we've been seeing in the last year and a lot of that i will say is due to vice mayor stip just asking the question and that's that's a responsibility we all have is ask the question there's no bad question to ask no. this is taxpayer money we all have to be responsible so thank you vice mayor and thank you for your compliment councilman hampton yes thank you as well for all your hard work with this i think it'll definitely help our community take another step forward like steps like just council member Stipp said as well to uh, provide just more resources for the community. Do, do we know? It's probably a harder question. We probably don't know this, but do you know? Do we expect a volume? Do we know how many people are eligible to be we ADA don't. compliant? Oh, it's our, a great question, Council Member Hampton, and that that's one we struggled with very early on. Um, because if you remember, our dial ride service area is so small; it's only where we have fixed route bus service. Yeah, it's that three quarter mile boundary. There's no way for us to tell outside of that boundary who is eligible. And then if they're eligible, whether they would even feel like they would want to use the service. So this is going to, that's why we wanted to do this as a pilot program. This gives us the opportunity to kind of check and see and evaluate and be able to tell how people in Goodyear, whether they would be willing to ride any kind of a transit related service. This is a little bit different from traditional transit service. And that's important too, because we're moving into a whole new frontier on the transit side about what kind of transit service we really want to, to have in Goodyear. So we're gonna find out, we're gonna find out slowly. Yeah. Um, and I'll be able to bring information back to you that gives you an idea of just how many people are using this program. And those are the people that are all ADA certified. Okay. So and we're gonna then, learn. And then I live in West Goodyear, so if I ran into somebody who needs this service, I just would give them not your number, but um, somebody, actually, somebody, somebody. You're all going to get this great brochure. Okay. It's not ready <laughs> yet. It's going to be ready in a in a, like two or three weeks, and I've got a guarantee from my friends at Valley Metro that we're going to get a whole bunch of these, and I want to make sure you all have them so that if you are ever asked that question, that you first don't feel compelled to determine whether somebody might be ADA eligible. You don't want to go there, no. um, but you want to give them this, and that's going to get them started uh, to figuring out whether they uh, need to be certified and then whether they would be eligible for ride choice. Okay. Thank you. We're going to set you up. All right. Thank you. Councilmember Campbell. So, uh, Christine, I'm very interested in the numbers. Okay. And I would appreciate not waiting six months to have Absolutely. the numbers. Um, this is something we've been working on for 15 years or longer, right. and... Um, I, I want to see what the response is, but I want to understand this right. We have maybe 25 or 30 people now who live in Goodyear who are ADA compliant that have already been 
determined that they have ADA requirements? They, they are eligible uh, under the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's right. To ride ride choice and dial ride. Okay. So ride choice, is it going to be a separate bus or is it a separate vehicle? And ride choice is like dial a ride. Okay. I mean, what's the Great difference question. here that we're talking Great about? Great question, Council Members. So, dial a ride are those small buses that you sometimes see with senior centers, and, yeah. and they only take about eight or 10 passengers, they're all wheelchair compliant. That's pretty much a typical dial a ride vehicle. Ride choice is going to offer a, a variety of different transportation options. It's Uber, is the service provider. When we last talked, Lyft was the service provider. That has changed. Lyft is no longer going to be that service provider. It's Uber. There's not going to be any difference between them. Most people that drive Lyft also drive Uber. So okay. Uber is a typical vehicle. Wheelchair accessible vehicles are going to be used for anybody that requires a wheelchair. When they call that phone number to make the ride choice appointment, that's when the person at the customer service center is going to be able to see whether they need a wheelchair, and then they will need a wheelchair accessible vehicle. So it just they depends. Have a mobility scooter. Correct. That's, that's the same as a wheelchair. That's right. Okay. So if somebody has a walker, um, the drive they may still get uh, a vehicle, just a, a regular vehicle, sedan or something like that. But the driver will know that he needs to hold the walker for the person so that they get in the vehicle. Okay. Um, so it's going to be a variety of different options that the logistics center is going to run through with the passenger when they talk to them on the phone. Anybody that gets ADA certified gets a number assigned to them, an identification number. So when they call the logistics center to make their reservation, that they number. just give them the number and all the profile information is there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And you will see those numbers a lot sooner than six months. Okay. Councilmember Kano. I just want to thank you for your work in making this modern and flexible response to a long time problem. Uh, I'm also interested in the numbers. I hope that it's wildly successful and that it, once it gets going, then it will encourage other people to participate. But this is an exciting solution. So thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Vazillo. You know, I'm interested in a program. I think it's a great program where we can help those. My only concern is, is, is a cap. And here, here's my thought. I remember a while back where the state gave a credit for, uh, I think it was um, uh, cars, um, for fuel discounts. Alternate fuel. No cap. Next thing you know, they ran out of money because <laughs> they had no idea who was going to use it. And the only thing that concerns me is you have the transfer, that's just fine. We don't know how many people are using it. We don't know how many may apply once this message gets out there. So I, I, would, I would appreciate um, getting the worst possible scenario once you get the number of ADA people that apply at the 400 maximum range to see what the worst case as far as the dollars are concerned. Because I know, and again, I, I like the program, but, but I always would love it better if I knew what the max or if we had a cap on it. Because without a cap on it, who knows what that could go? Because right. we don't know what that is out there. There may be triple or four times the number of people that are going to use this that we think are in there right now. So right. that's my concern with the program without having a cap on it. So um, as soon as you can get an idea when they actually apply and it gets out there, because I can see a lot of people far out uh, in the community that need this service. I'd just like to know what we're, we're talking about. So. Understood. Thank you. Um, just one more point about that, Council Member. In addition to monitoring how many people use it and uh, being able to track our funds, what we're also going to watch is to see whether the people that are using it are not using dial a ride instead. In other words, those 25 to 30 people I told you about, there's about 10 to 12 of them that are using dial a ride. Believe it or not, our budget for dial a ride this year from Valley Metro is $75,000. What we are hoping people that are riding dial a ride will do is give up dial a ride and take ride choice instead because a ride choice ride is less is more than less than half the cost of dial a ride. So we're going to be monitoring it to see if we get any kind of a, a benefit from people jumping off dial a ride and going to ride choice instead. So you're going to get that information. And I think that'd be very valuable to know, but I always get a little skittish when there's no cap because I've seen in the past where that's gone south as a result of not knowing what that is. So Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, let's vote on this. By the way, good job. Whoop, I don't know. You have something you would like or add? 
So I just wanted to thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Member. I just wanted to remind you that as at least as this part for the first two years, we do have a cap of two hundred thousand dollars per year. Oh, so it is capped at that. Yes, oh, it yes. is. Okay. Yes. All right. That, I, I saw the transfer, but I didn't realize it was capped at that. So okay. two hundred thousand the first year, two hundred thousand the second year. If we spend that whole two hundred thousand the first year, no matter what, we're coming back to you and and giving you information on that, and you'll be able to make a decision either way. This two hundred thousand that you're approving tonight is just for the first year. Okay. I, okay. Thank you for clarification. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. All right. Let's vote this. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Good job, Christine. And the last item on business is number 20 to consider approving the Bullard Wash Emergency Remediation and Construction Work. Engineer Director Rebecca Sook and Engineering Deputy Director Samit Rohan will present. Hello. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm very pleased to introduce to you tonight Samit Mohan. He is our Deputy Director of Engineering. He's been with us for about four months. He is going to provide you with the update on the Bullard Wash, but I have asked him to just maybe take a moment and give you a little bit of information about his experience so you get to know him a little bit and understand what experience he brings to us. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Sumit, and it is such a pleasure for me to be presenting to you tonight. Uh, I'm new to the city of Goodyear, fairly new, four months, but not new to the state of Arizona. I have worked in Arizona civil service for over 28 years. Most of that has been with the city of Phoenix, almost 19 years, where I was largely responsible for managing engineering design and construction of a large number of infrastructure management projects in addition, I was also involved in many Kaizen committees to improve the $5 billion capital improvement program of the city of Phoenix, all departments included. With that said, I really, again, am very grateful for this opportunity to be presenting to you tonight. So in as much as you have seen the same slight pattern tonight a few times, uh, I'll talk to you about the Bullard Wash Tailwater Project. Just a little bit of uh, background information. Uh, this topic has come up in the last few council meetings, so I'll just uh, make this brief. Uh, Bullard Wash, the area of concern right now, which is under city's jurisdiction, is between Camelback Road to the north and Indian School Road to the south. And uh, this has been, uh, Bullard Wash was improved in the year 2004, and on the western edge, we had, we installed a 24-inch storm drain pipe which uh, flows like this, and also a low flow channel uh, was installed on the east edge, which is shown by these arrows. So this is the general uh, location of the Bullard Wash. Uh, since around the year 2014, we have seen increased irrigation flows, and the city started preparing the responses in many different fashions, one of which was curbing uh, south of Camelback Road, so that the flows could be directed into the 24-inch storm drain. In addition to that, more curbing was installed, so the overflow could go into the low-flow channel on the east edge. Uh, also, the city hired a firm to study the origins of flows uh, so that we could find out where these tailwaters were coming from. In addition, we also planned a CIP project in the current fiscal year 2020 to add some signage at the pedestrian crossings and also to add elevated sidewalks or crossings, partly inspired by the Scottsdale Indian Bend Wash. This is a picture from just south of Indian School Road near Hayden Road. Um, in the summer in, of the year 2019, our surface flows increased substantially. So as a result, we cctv the closed circuit television, uh, the 24-inch storm drain, and that report that just came out a uh, few weeks ago, I identified some blockages in different sections of the storm drain. We found debris or mud in many sections. Also found some operational problems of roots uh, of trees that found their way, they are water seeking. They found their way into the corrugated storm drain pipe. And also we found that there was a dry utility boring that had happened, which caused uh, one particular segment of the pipe to collapse. As a result, 
we determined that we need to react to the situation as fast as we could. This has become a very vocal issue for our community in the last few weeks and months. We realized that we must bypass the storm drain before we can repair or replace. So what you will see here is our, the red line shows the bypass route where we are going to be installing, and we are in the process right now, of installing the HTPE temporary bypass pipes. And there are blockages all along the storm drain pipe, but there are two locations, as I've shown in the purple uh, blocks. Those are the areas where the blockages are major. So our plan is to bypass the flows. So the latest activities on this project are here. Uh, this is as of last week. Uh, we right now have an eight-week schedule to work on this problem. And uh, on day one, on Thursday, September 19th, we brought Hunter Contracting on board to start bypassing of flows. And also, once we are able to uh, dry the pipe, then we will be able to evaluate our options for repairing the pipe, which could be include spot repair or cured in place pipe or remove and replace. And we might have to do a mixture of different options to find the ultimate solution. Also, I'm extremely pleased about the fantastic uh, progress that the bypassing uh, installation has been uh, going through. Uh, just in the first two days, uh, almost 2,000 feet of the HDP pipe was installed. And if any of you have driven in that area, you might notice this uh, black pipe, HDPE, uh, which uh, is being put in place right now. And we'll be uh, bypassing the whole mile so that we can do a thorough analysis and find a complete solution, hopefully for once and all. With that said, uh, we are seeking authorization uh, from you uh, and requesting you to please uh, uh, authorize funding uh, in the amount of uh, $695,000. And there are two funding options that you might have seen in the Council Action Report, funding option one and the number two. And you can see that the main difference there is between the city manager's contingency being used for one-time portion and also council special project fund. It is our request that you please approve uh, option number two. Oh, you're just, I'm sorry. All right, you're finished. Thank you. Yes, that I am. Thank a, you, ma'am. That was a pretty good report, and I think we're surprised. So let's go on. And um, are there any speaker cards? No, Mayor. Would anybody in the audience like to speak? All right, then can I have a motion and a second to approve a budget transfer needed up to 695000 as shown in the funding option two, and all expenditures necessary to address emergency repairs to the stormwater and irrigation system in Bullard Wash Phase 1 Park. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I heard a motion by Councilman Hampton and a second by Councilman Campbell. Campbell, so open for discussion. Councilman Hampton. Yeah, I say thank you for moving on this. I know um, residents have been very concerned about this, so I appreciate you uh, looking at it and pulling it up and also bringing different options to be able to get a better solution for for this issue for our residents. So. I am supportive of it. I think funding option two is a is a good option. And yeah, I'm looking forward to moving forward on it. So thank you. Uh, th thank you, Councilman. Councilman Vazello. A couple questions. First question on the Council Special Project Fund, probably one more for Doug. What's the balance in that fund when the 125 comes out? verify this for you for sure but I believe it'll be twelve thousand dollars remaining and that is the fund that every fiscal year we said we would replenish to a hundred thousand dollars through the budget process okay so with this transfer if council wants to do any special projects that's gone Correct. reality that's gone. Correct. how much the balance in the city manager's contingency one time with 125 coming out of it uh, with 125,000 coming out there would be 125,000 remaining so I guess in reality, if the council wanted to do something, we could still tap that city manager's contingency one time if we so choose. So there's still available funds in there. Is that is that fair option? Correct. Okay. 
last question. Uh, with all of these improvements to the wash, will this alleviate all the flows going through the Pebble Creek uh, roads? Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member, for this question. And uh, that is our hope. Uh, we had done a study that J.E. Fuller Engineering did on our behalf, and they found the tailwaters are about 30 cubic feet per second, which comes out to about 18 million gallons per day. And the pipe that is in uh, the 24-inch storm drain pipe by itself can carry most of that flow with only the overflow going into the low flow channel. And if the pipe is operating well, and then it can carry most of the flow. So we might see some water in the low flow channel, but not the kind of flooding that we have been seeing uh, in the last few months or even the last few years. But there still probably will be some flows at peaks going through those roads, I would assume. There, there is a likelihood, Councilor. Okay. So, so I'm, uh, I see somebody stepping in here in a second. Rebecca. Chime in here. I can see it. I guess what I'm getting to is this is going to, re going to relieve somewhat, but I, I, I'm getting possibly the impression that Robeson is still probably going to have to do something with that road or maybe is that too big of a leap? So I would like to thank you very much for those questions. Um, I would like to add that um, we have been coordinating very proactively with uh, the Robeson and Pebble Creek community. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to go and be speaking um, at a, a presentation. Um, they, on their own, are aware that they're going to have to do some different things. They were waiting to see what we were going to do in order to make that decision. I will tell you in your specific question about is this going to relieve, it will relieve it somewhat. But here's what I would like to share with you is to, uh, this summer's flows were like they never were before. They were consistent. They didn't stop for four or five months. We never had that before. We already, always had opportunities for dry up to go in and care for um, our areas, our park, our linear park. We were able to go in and mow the lawn. There were different things like that, as was Pebble Creek. We didn't have that opportunity this year. So I would hesitate to answer your question with 100% assurity, only because I don't know what next year brings. The only reason why I ask it is a wash is just mm -hmm. that water flows through it absolutely um and since it was somewhat dry I, you know I'd, I'd be curious we don't have to go into it now why those flows were so much higher unless there's that much irrigation or that much development in the upper part that's causing those those runoffs um because to me it didn't seem to be a very rainy season this year at least as far as monsoons are concerned but uh but again i'm glad the city's stepping up and doing its share but uh, my only concern is I don't think it's going to resolve everything. I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I don't think it's going to resolve everything. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor? I want to piggyback on what Rebecca said, and I think it's really, really important for uh, the uh, news media that's here. This is not NOT going to stop all of the flow, ALL. Cool through Pebble Creek. Um, we, we have a wash that is designed to carry water to the ultimate source, which is the Gila River. And um, we cannot stop the water from flowing in there, but we can certainly do our best to keep it at a minimum. And I, I just wanna be very, very clear. And if I've misspoken, please correct me. You said it correctly, Vice Mayor. And the thing is that now that we are aware of the damaged pipe, uh, it is our responsibility to repair it uh, and while trying to minimize the damage and the hurt that the residents of Pebble Creek and the other students going to Millennium High School or the other crossing, pedestrian crossing between Camelback and Indy School. Uh, you are absolutely right. It is a wash, and that's where water is supposed to flow, and any park use that we want to have out of this should be just supplementary and mostly for good days. Uh, and also as land development occurs upstream and up north, it is our hope, uh, and we just don't know when that will happen, but in due course of time, maybe this wash will never see water in a few years. But I think it's important that we manage expectation, et cetera. And if we look at the properties that are north of Camelback that are all surrounded by Luke, they're all affected by the APZ, and um, we may not see a lot of development there. It may, it may be farmland for a long time, um, but 
based on our water conversation at the beginning of this meeting, hopefully we can work on water conservation issues so we're not sending a million gallons um, into the dry river bottom of, of the Gila River. So um, thank you so much for your work on this. I know this has been a her Herculean task to get through it, but um, patience is always is always important. And then the teamwork between uh, the community of Pebble Creek, who is um, really impacted by that, and the city who's protecting the Palm Valley uh, development to the north. Um, I think the cooperation is, is the key to, to our ultimate success. So thank you. We appreciate it, Vice Mayor. Councilman Kano. Well, I'm thrilled we have a plan and it, it's being put in motion. And I just, as a sidebar, wanted to welcome you to Goodyear. You're very highly respected in the city of Phoenix, and we're thrilled to have you here. Thank you, Councilman Kano. Councilman Campbell. Okay, my question is for Rebecca, I believe. Uh, do we know who the dry utility boring who did it and can we go back and get some of this money from them to repair whatever they did and how did we not know that this happened uh, council member we have uh, asked for utility locating that is commonly known as blue stick uh, we are still waiting to find the results and once we identify then we will start our process of finding uh, uh, who did it and why they did it and how they should be held responsible for their portion of damage. So we don't have the final uh, blue staking done yet. Uh, also, uh, if we don't uh, see any blue stake marks, if that happens, in that case, we'll basically sever that line, then somebody will be calling us. Rebecca, I think you want to add to that. I can see it. Do you have any additional question? Council? Yes, I do. Okay. I'm just trying to digest what he said, and Joe's trying to explain to me. So um, so we do not. We don't know who did we it, do not but we're know trying who to find is. out who did it. We absolutely are okay. trying to find out. And um, what Sumit ended with is that if we, so ultimately we're calling out Blue Stake to identify. If we do Very not find good. out who it is, the line will be cut, Okay. and then we'll find out who it is. All right, my additional questions are the 2,000 linear feet that you're running, how big is that pipe? Is it 24 inches or is it larger? It's 24 inches, which is exactly what we have in the ground. Okay, so how, how many gallons can a 24-inch pipe handle, if, supposedly, if it's not blocked? Uh, if it's not blocked, then a pipe at flowing at about 6 feet per second, which is normal, will carry about 18 million gallons per day. 18 million gallons? Okay, all right. And then my uh, last question is, do we, um, Rebecca, historically check the wash to see if it's flowing right? I mean, like you, you did mention in 2004 we did some updates. Um, have we not checked it since 2004? I mean, do we have a plan? And who does it? And um, I'm going to cue Javier to come up here in just one moment because uh, this year they're doing a storm water study. This would be something that would be um, uh, some of the funds could be utilized to maintain this line. Okay. So we'll miss him. And council member, if I may just add briefly that 2004 is when this bullet wash, this area was developed for the first time. I'm sorry, um, what? The bullet wash was developed for the first time in 2004. But it was there before 2004. Correct. But this is just the improvements uh, on the oh, the storm oh, drain oh, was oh, installed I, I, for the first time in 2004. Okay. That's why you. I mentioned 2004. But when there's a problem, then I'm sure we have okay. uh, inspected and observed and tried to figure out. Since 2014, there has been an active effort of trying to identify the sources of flows and try to decide uh, where we can possibly get the reductions. Okay. Okay. So, Mayor and Council, I can give you an overview of our stormwater system. Um, so, the stormwater system has been grown over the years, and the city has done a great job by addressing the needs of that system by all the departments working together. We've gotten to a point where we really need to address our, our stormwater system in a different way. So, this year we're doing an assessment that will include um, a completing an inventory of our, all of our uh, stormwater assets. 
um, also development of the all the operational needs of that uh, of those systems also developing a capital program as part of our asset replacement program for the stormwater system and then figuring out how much all of that's going to cost what resources we need and developing a program that addresses the stormwater system as a separate utility and then will someone actually go out and look at it periodically we'll, we'll, so that we know creating, creating the structure year you're checking it correct because apparently we have not had Cre anything creating a formal going. structure for maintaining our stormwater system okay Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Hampton, you had another question? Yeah, I just had a follow-up, and this is maybe off the wall, but generally, if we have excess water on the way to the river, do we try to capture that water at all? And can we inject that water into for our water portfolio? Well, I think Javier needs to answer that one. <laughs> I want all the water we can get. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So, uh, Mayor Council Member Hampton, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It actually is a, something that we're trying to figure out. The challenge with developing an infrastructure for capturing water is knowing that the water will be there today and in the future. So it's, it's part of the equation. So we could go out there and develop this huge infrastructure to capture it and, and inject it back in the ground, but is it going to be there 10 years from now? Yeah, and, and we don't know that, but... I just, if I can get free water, that's that's good for the city. So. <laughs> We're brainstorming how to make it, uh, use yeah. of that, uh, for at least for the time that it's there. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, my want is that, you know, I've gotten so many calls and, and different conversations uh, about washes from the, and uh, to the point where they, uh, they've said to me, well, I, I don't think we need those, and I don't know why you have them. Um, just like I don't know why we have the rabbits and I don't want to have the birds out there. And, you know, we don't need all that. Well, so they just don't understand the desert. Um, they don't understand, you know, think back when the Indians had the irrigation system, when they when they developed how brilliant they were. Um, so it's it's a little bit of history has to be said with this to make them understand um, that because you, you come from Detroit, Chicago, New York, whatever, the system is not the same. And so you have to understand it's a little bit more complicated because nature plays a role in it. And nature you can't always control. So that's my hope that when you go out and speak that, that you will get people to look at this um, as a, an environmental process that happens in the desert. So, uh, and I appreciate welcome. Thank you. Um, Thank you I man. think uh, you're, you're going to enjoy this because you heard all the questions. You could have been up there and they never asked you one question. Look at all the <laughs> questions they asked no. you. So they were I very curious. So we look forward to having you before us again. And Rebecca, thank you very much. And I think we're finished with this subject. Is that right for now? Thank you very much. I appreciate right. the opportunity. And that takes us to the end. I got the right paper. So now we're... Uh, Oh, we have to vote on it. Yes, okay. All right, let's do it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations. All right. Does the council have any common comments or accommodations, report or events? Yes. Councilman Loretano. Okay, this, this Saturday our mayor is going to um, be our grand marshal in the oh. parade for mm -hmm. Estrella, uh -huh. Foothills High School. So, of course, since it's homecoming, oh my, we get her a <laughs> Wolves football shirt. <laughs> So she can cheer the team on, and it says Mayor Number One. Oh, oh how nice. nice! Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Here's your bag. Oh, thank you. Who else? Any? Thank you, Sherry. I'm looking forward to it. Um, any other comments? No news. No comments. Okay. Then I'm going to turn this over to the city manager. Manager, do you have anything to report? Uh, just one item, Mayor and uh, Council. I just wanted to, again, highlight that Goodyear was named um, the 22nd best place to live in the nation by Money Magazine. Um, it's important to note that this was not something we applied for. This is not something 
um, that we paid for as far as advertising. Uh, the process Money Magazine uses is they look and, and look at all demographic information. They look at our economy, our housing, education, quality of life, and they put all this information together to compile this list. And there's further proof of that because once we were notified that we were a finalist, they asked us for pictures. So we were able to share that part of the story. But when the actual article came out, it talked about how our residents can dip their toes in the Gila River. Um, <laughs> so I think that just goes to prove that, you know, this was something that was uh, truly organic and we're uh, very proud of this honor. And of course, I uh, want to give credit to the, the vision of council and the hard work of staff and our great community that made this all possible. So thank you. Great. Thank you. So if uh, anything else before you, we adjourn this meeting. Okay, the next meeting is a retreat on October 4th and 5th, okay. 2019, and a regular meeting will be October 7th, 2019. No further business, this meeting is adjourned.